Afin, we could not hear what you have said. Uh, please come again. And I request others, other participants to please be on mute in order to avoid such kind of uh, disturbance. Please be on mute. Now yes, I sir. request Professor G. G. Ahmed Zeeshan, head and coordinator IQAC, to introduce the chief guest of today's function, Professor Dr. Anil D. Sahastrabuddha Ji, Chairman, All India Council for Technical Education, New Delhi. Please, sir. Distinguished delegates, participants from various engineering colleges across India, ladies and gentlemen, a very pleasant morning to one and all. Holding the sheen beckon of marvelous excellence and unparalleled commitment and the noble thought of chiseling thousands of crystals into rare gems, Global Institute of Engineering and Technology is radiating the path of young generation of engineers and managers in Course of students are fulfilling their marching dreams to make the process like engineering, civil engineering, Engineering and technology is also a recognized center to work within the field of Kaushal Vikas Yojana. It's because of the tireless effort of Mr. K.F. Arifuddin Sir, Secretary, Global Group of Institutions. Mr. K.F. Arifuddin Sir is the Secretary of Medina Group of Institutions. He is a pioneer in the field of education. He is the founder of Medina Group of Institutions. Education and Global Group of Education. He is a lawyer by profession and an author of many inspirational books as well. He has completed his graduation and post-graduation in law from Usmania University in 1972. In 1982, with the inception of the Medina Public School, there has been no, there's been no looking back ever since. His dream of transferring the society through the process of quality education stands fulfilled. He always believed the out-of-box thinking and innovative approaches are important qualities of a genuine engineer. 
Aiming at developing world-class engineers in 2006, Global Institute of Engineering and Technology was started with a vision of building up the standards of educational institution to provide the quality technical education in a splendid nature. GIT is located at Moinabad in a sprawling campus spread over 30 acres of lush green environment, provides an ambient study atmosphere. GIT has been <laughs> career building for thousands of students. Students have brought laurels to the institution and they would definitely fulfill the demands of the fast paced industries. Coming to the Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering, which is hosting a three day faculty development program on outcome based education and importance of accreditation to enhance the quality of technical education. Ladies and gentlemen, the Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering was started in the year 2006 which currently offers UG in ECE and PG in Embedded System, which is headed by Mr. G. M. Sanchez. The department has faculty holding bachelor degrees and many departments hold either UG or PG degrees. The department believes that regularity and punctuality are the marks of success and is good for hard work. Now, I request Sir G. Ahmed Zisham, Head and Coordinator, IQAC, to introduce the Chief Guest of today's function, Professor Dr. E. Chairman, Volunteer Education. A very good morning to one and all present in the panel and the participants from various colleges. It's indeed my deepest privilege to introduce the chief of today's function, Professor Dr. Anil B. Sahasrabuddeji. Professor Anil Sahasrabuddeji is Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati, joined All, all India Council for Technical Education as chairman on 17th of July 2015. Professor Anil B. Sahasrabuddeji graduated from BBB College of Engineering and Technology, Hubli. Affiliated to Karnataka University, Dharwar, Karnataka in mechanical engineering with first rank and gold medal in 1980. Subsequently, sir, obtained master's and doctoral degrees with UGC fellowship from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore in 1982 and 1989 respectively. Professor Anil D. Sahasbuddhi in his illustrious career of 31 years held several academic, research, administrative positions. Sir started his career as scientific officer at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore in 1983 and moved to Tata Consulting Services Engineers as engineer in the same year. Sir served as lecturer and assistant professor at Northeastern Regional Institute of Science and Technology, NERIST Itanagar, Arunachal Pradesh from 1987 to 1988 and again from 1989 to 1995 before joining IIT as associate professor in 1995 and has been serving as professor since 1999. Also sir, served as Director College of Engineering Pune since 2006 on deputation from IIT Guwahati prior to joining as AACD Chairman. As an academician and researcher in NARIST and IIT Guwahati and as administrator in the capacity of Director College of Engineering Pune, sir has taken up several initiatives for academic, 
curricular, co-curricular activities, entrepreneurship, research, and good governance. Professor Anil D. Sahasrabuddhe is presently working as chairman and expert member on various national level committees. Some of these include chairman, basic scientific research, BSR, empowered committee of UGC, Swayam board, and chairman BOG of NIT as member fellow is actively involved in activities of many professional bodies and societies such as ISTE, ASME, ASEE, ASI, IET and Institute of Engineers. Sir was awarded with Maha Entrepreneur Award 2011 of Praj Industries Pune for his leadership and innovative abilities in the area of technology development and entrepreneurship initiatives. With these few introductory words, I ask of management, staff, and students of Global Institute of Engineering Technology welcome you, sir. Thank you, sir. Now I request Mrs. Nuzat Tunisa, Associate Head, Department of EC, to introduce the guest of honor of today's function, Professor Dr. A. Govardhan, sir, yes. Professor of CSE, Rectar and Registrar in Charge, Jawaharlal Nehru Technological University, Hyderabad. Please, ma'am. A very good morning to all the dignitaries, participants from different institutions, and my dear colleagues. It's my privilege to introduce our guest of honor, Dr. A. Govardhan, Registrar in Charge, JNTU, Hyderabad. Sir believes three things are necessary to make every person and every nation great, which are conviction of the powers of good, absence of jealousy and suspicion, helping all who are trying to be good and do good. Sir is presently a professor of computer science and engineering, director and ex executive council member, Jawaharlal Nehru, Hyderabad. Sir served and held seven academic and administrative positions. Sir is the recipient of 33 international and national awards. To list a few, oh, Best Senior Scientist Award 2018, oh, the Academic Leadership Award, oh, Dr. Savay Pali Radha Krishnan Award, National Award, AP State Government Best Teacher Award 2012, and the list just goes on. Sir is the chairman and member on several board of studies of various universities and also a member on editorial boards for 12 international journals. Sir is an editor for four Springer proceedings. Sir has guided 85 PhD theses, one MPhil and 135 PhD projects. Sir has published more than 500 research papers at international and national journals, conferences including IEEE, ACM, Springer, LZWR and in, in their signs. Sir has delivered more than 100 keynote speeches and invited lectures. He, is chaired, he has shared 22 sessions at international and national conferences in India and abroad. Sir is a member on, on several professional and service oriented bodies to list a few ISTE, CSI, ISCA, ACM, IEEE, and many more. His area of research includes databases data science and information retrieval systems. With these few introductory words, we welcome you to our online faculty development program, sir. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Now, now I request now I Mr. Special Minister, Minister, Assistant Professor to introduce the special invitee and keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Arun K. Tangirala, Professor of Chemical Engineering, IIT Madras. Please, ma'am. Now, now I request Mrs. Ishra Tunisa, Assistant Professor, to introduce the special invitee and keynote speaker, 
Professor Dr. Arun K. Tangirala, Professor of Chemical Engineering, IIT Madras. Please, ma'am. Good morning to all the dignitaries, respective participants from various colleges. It's a privilege to introduce Dr. Arun Tangirala, sir. Dr. Tang Arun Tangirala, sir, obtained his bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from IIT Madras in 1996 and doctorate in process control and monitoring from the University of Alberta and Damon in 2001. After a short period of postdoctoral fellowship and research manager position at the U of Alberta, Sir has joined IITM as a visiting faculty in 2004. He is presently a professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering, IIT Madras, and associate faculty at the Robert Bosch Center for Data Sciences and Artificial Intelligence, IIT Madras. Dr. Tarinlanga, uh, Tangirala sir, interest and specialization are in the broad field of process system, engineering, and data science. Sir is the recipient of several teaching and research awards from U of Alberta and IIT Madras. Sir is the author of a comprehensive book on principle of system identification published by CRC Press in 2014 which is widely used as a classroom text. Sir is presently serving as the Editor-in-Chief of the Institution of Engineers India, General Series E and the Associate Editor of the ASME General of Dynamics, Measurements and Control. With this short introduction, we welcome you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. As our chief guest has joined now, due to some technical issue, I request now Professor G. M. Zishan, sir, to introduce our chief guest once again. Please, sir. A very good morning to all present in the panel and the participants from various colleges. It's indeed my deepest privilege to introduce the chief guest of today's function, Professor Dr. Anil Sastrabuddeji. Professor Anil Dattatre Sastrabuddhi Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati, joined All India Council for Technical Education, AICT, as chairman on 17 July 2015. Professor Anil D. Sahasrabhade graduated from BVB College of Engineering and Technology, Hubli, affiliated to Karnataka University, Dharwar, Karnataka, in Mechanical Engineering, with first rank and gold medal in 1980. Subsequently, sir, oh, I think, I think, uh, leave, leave it at the, leave it at that. Yeah. You know, this uh, yeah. less sir, time. Sir was awarded. Was sir was struggling. awarded so with the uh, Maha Entrepreneur Award 2011. With these few introductory words, sir, I welcome you. I, on behalf of uh, management staff and students, welcome you for this three-day FDP on uh, uh, outcome-based education and importance of accreditation to enhance the quality of technical education. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you, Abdul, uh, uh, Ahmad Faizan, Professor Govardhan, uh, uh, Afrin Begum, Tangriala, and uh, all others who have joined this particular uh, in workshop. Very important workshop at this crucial juncture because uh, AICT has mandated that all the institutions should get accredited within the next three to four years. And one year out of that is already over. So there are only three years left for all institutions to come on board and get themselves accredited. Now there are a variety of reasons for uh, getting accreditation. Number one, it is a mark of quality. So when uh, NBA, National Board of Accreditation, became signatory to the Washington Accord, exactly five years ago we became full members and uh, the review is on and our processes have been found to be very robust amongst the various countries who are signatories to the Washington Accord. And therefore, it is very significant that we are in the league with the best of the nations in terms of accreditation processes. Now, accreditation itself being based on the outcomes, and there are 12 parameters on which uh, the entire accreditation process rests, right from uh, the curriculum, the design of the curriculum, the problem solving ability, the teamwork, engineer and the society, the values, ethics. I think these are all very, very important parameters, not only for 
education, but also for industry, for society, for governance. And therefore, whatever is being done in an institution under outcome-based education needs to be evaluated by a team of people. And therefore, associated with that, there are a few other reforms which AICT has undertaken, which has great value. I would like to just briefly tell about one or two of them so that you get an idea of how accreditation is linked with the various reforms. When we talk about what is required by the industry today is to be taught to the students. A very important thing which happens is the curriculum revision, which has to be at regular intervals, not once in a five years, 10 years time. And therefore, uh, model curriculum and therefore adoption of that is very significant and important. Having done this, uh, teachers have to be trained in that and therefore faculty development programs uh, in all the new upcoming niche areas becomes again significant, whether it is AI, IoT, machine learning, uh, 3D printing, robotics, blockchain, cloud computing, cybersecurity, data analytics. These are all very important courses which have come into the curriculum and teachers have to be trained in them. Uh, the real game changers, I would like to say, are two. Number one, the three-week student induction program for the freshmen first-year students associated with that, what is known as a elective earlier, and now we want to make it mandatory, is universal human values. I, I think this is the course where all the parameters of uh, the NBA accreditation, in some sense, find their, their roots, uh, whether it is in terms of communication skills, whether it is values, whether it is uh, how we really deal with students and faculty and society, and how truthfulness, honesty, integrity plays a very important role. These are all embedded in this particular course, as well as student uh, induction program. The next one is uh, the examination reforms. Uh, all along, we have been used to the question paper, which are based on memory. That means those who are able to do rote learning are capable of getting marks, whereas those who really understand the subject try to apply it and maybe in the process do mistakes are not valued at all. And therefore, the new examination reforms policy of AICT, where we talk about Bloom's taxonomy and how higher levels of learning are to be evaluated. Uh, that means it is not just memory-based learning, which we have said that it should be restricted to at most 30%. Rest of the 70% of the questions have to be necessarily be understanding of the subject, application, analysis, critical thinking, and also innovation and creativity. Uh, I think this is what we have been talking about. And this, if you do in right earnest, automatically you get accredited. Last but not the least, having made accreditation mandatory, the support system in order to make institutions to realize this and to go ahead. The workshops of this nature are very, very useful. So I thank uh, the Institute for having organized this workshop. But more importantly, we have a scheme called Marg Darshan and Marg Darshak. That means a system of mentoring by well-performing institutions to the institutions we are in tier two, tier three places on one way. And the other way, there are Huge number of faculty retired from IITs, NITs, and best universities who have themselves spent their whole academic life of four, four decades and are still active. Why can't we make use of their resource into the institutions who require this help? And uh, through this scheme of Margudarshak, by identifying such faculty members and sending to the institution maybe once in a week, uh, one day, or once in a month, uh, for three days at a stretch, and then seeing at the processes and improving those processes. But ultimately, it is the processes which make the transformation. And therefore, uh, engaging with faculty, students in an institution through Marga Darshaks is another way of uh, really empowering institutions in order to get themselves accredited. And lastly, I would like to mention uh, another importance of accreditation is all those uh, students who graduate from such institutions which are accredited their graduates are treated on equal terms in all the countries where the accreditation process similar to ours is followed under Washington Accord. So this is a great benefit and advantage. And in the recent times, uh, many of our graduates from different colleges who are working in either uh, 
UAE and earlier in Kuwait, their visas were cancelled because the colleges from where they came were not accredited. Please remember, uh, the world over, the importance of accreditation is improving, not just uh, running of a program, but accredited program. And therefore, uh, my appeal to all of you, uh, those who are part of this particular uh, session, I see 136 plus uh, people who have registered. Make best use of this. We have faculty from IITs, we have faculty from different organizations who have been uh, in the process of accreditation will help you in understanding the nuances and how in your own institutions you provide this support for your own faculty and students and finally get accredited. Uh, thank you very much uh, for bearing with me. Uh, I really had uh, trouble because I was uh, traveling uh, on road and I tried on the mobile, did not work, I came to the office, tried through the, the computer, did not uh, work. But finally, through another alternate uh, tool, I am able to access and then come on, on board. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for your enlightenment towards outcome-based education and accreditation. Thank you, sir. We welcome you, sir. I very humbly request Professor Ravindra Tiwari, Dean Global Professional Colleges, to deliver the welcome address. Please, ma'am. A very good morning, one and all. I, Dr. Mrs. Ravindra Tiwari, Dean Global Professional Colleges, deem it a great opportunity and a proud privilege to extend a hearty, warm welcome, big enough to encompass all our genial and convivial members of this magnanimous gathering. At the outset, it is my proud privilege to welcome our esteemed, boisterous, and prodigious chief guest of today's function, Professor Anil Sahastrabudhi, sir. Sir, namaste, welcome you. As we have already seen his introduction, it is voluminous. Thank you, sir, for being with us. Now, I welcome our distinguished and very pronounced persona, guest of honor of today's event, Dr. A. Govardhan Garu, Professor in CAC, Rector and in charge, Registrar of JNTH. I welcome you, sir. I feel privileged to welcome the special invitee, Professor Arun K. Tangarila, sir, Professor in Chemical Engineering, IIT Madras. He is also our keynote speaker. We welcome you, sir. Now I'm speechless, wordless, rather breathless to welcome our beloved secretary, sir, Mr. K.M. Alifuddin, who is a pioneer behind every activity to be executed to core perfection. Sir, we welcome you and thank you for being with us despite your slight indisposed health. We are praying for it, sir. Thank you so much. Now I take privilege to welcome the dynamic and tireless director, Minajuddin, sir, the zestful and vigorous Khaja Fasyuddin, sir, our deputy director, our principal, Dr. K. Sivelingam Garu, and other resource persons. The names which I would like to mention are our Bhagya uh, Raju, sir, and also our uh, Shankar, sir. I take the privilege to welcome our extremely spirited heads of the departments the energetic and committed coordinators and organizers of this marvelous FDP program. Mention to be made to the coordinator, Mr. Ahmed Lishan. Our dedicated faculty, all the participants of this August virtual gathering, we welcome you. We are immensely blessed, extremely excited, and terribly thrilled. As it is customary, a few words I would like to share here. I'm sure that this three-day FDP will end up in resounding success and will be very useful as stated by Sir sir. The coordinators were shortlisted and it was a very Herculean task because the number went up to 1,500. And I would like to brief a little bit already introduce our college, which was established in 2006 under our a. K. Marfudin, sir, renowned educationist with dedicated and quality service for last four decades. 
A visionary who believes in no compromise for quality education. And as far as GIT is concerned, his prime vision is to produce technologically skilled engineers of world-class competency. Apart from the courses and all which were briefed by the introductory speech, I would like to state here that, yes, 14 sectors of skill development programs under the mandate of AACT, we can say, were completed successfully for two academic years. The college is honored to be recognized as an outstanding engineering college in Telangana for industry interface in the year 2019 by Center for Education and Growth Research, New Delhi. Sir, such of this, sir, you were there as chief guest that time as well. But whether it is Swayam, MOOC classes, NITTR, NAPTIL, our management constantly supports effectively both the students and the staff to pursue these digitally innovated programs. Keeping in view the stage through which our country is passing, slight deviation, rather the whole world is worried about this pandemic. As per the direction of ACT, we are putting all our efforts, humble efforts, to bring awareness to fight this COVID-19. A webinar on 18th of April was hosted, sir, with the title, Plank the Curve COVID-19, which had an overwhelming response. An air cushion competition was conducted to have some guidelines for the students, and the title was Lockdown and its Effects on Lifestyle. Our students were involved in making videos of various aspects, including guidelines, pros and cons, on COVID-19 and were posted on our college website as well as social media. Our students of CSE branch have also developed an app to this extent. We took pledge on COVID-19, India fights back. We paid tributes to our COVID warriors and a quiz competition on COVID-19 was also conducted for the students to bring awareness. There was promotion of Arogya Setu app in five villages adopted by our college under Unnat Bharat Abhiyan. Let me add here, despite whatever difficulties we are facing, I was slightly overwhelmed when people would say that work from home. I used to think that it is all, you know, humbug and all cap, but now I feel that if we want, teaching, learning can continue offline and we can make best of the use of this lockdown period. Now, I would like to salute along with all of us, our heroes of COVID-19. And we, we will start this event for, and I also thank you for giving me this opportunity. I'm sure with not only this FDP program, but we will come up with flying colors even with this COVID-19. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. It's my deepest privilege to invite Professor Dr. A. Govardhan, Professor of CSE, Jekta and Registrar in charge, JNUH, to address the gathering. Please, sir. Yeah, distinguished uh, dignitaries of the program, uh, the chief guest of uh, today's uh, inaugural function, uh, the visionary leader and the chairman of uh, AICTE, uh, Professor Anil D. Sahasrabudreji, and other distinguished uh, uh, speakers and invitees, and uh, Professor Arun K. Tangirala uh, is the uh, professor from IIT Madras, and we have uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Minhajuddin, Director of Global Professional Colleges, and uh, Mr. Kaja Fasiuddin, Deputy Director, Global Professional Colleges, and uh, Principal of the College, Professor uh, K. Shivalingam, and uh, Dean of uh, GPC, Professor uh, Dr. Ravindra uh, Tiwari, other uh, distinguished uh, invitees, guests, delegates, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, very good, good morning to you all. It is indeed a uh, very uh, momentous occasion. I am extremely happy to get associated with this uh, uh, inaugural function on uh, outcome-based education and the uh, importance of accreditation to enhance uh, quality of uh, technical education. Uh, 
is it audible am i audible am i audible yes sir you yes, are audible right thank you thank you so which is yes, being sir. organized by a department of uh, ece uh, of global institute of engineering and technology my uh, best compliments and congratulations to the entire team of uh, uh, you know these uh, organizers and uh, as rightly mentioned by the chairman the chief guest of today's program uh you know the traditional educational systems are being replaced by the you know uh, latest uh, uh, outcomes uh, based education and uh, there is a there is a continuous paradigm shift that we see uh, in terms of the teaching learning practices and also the adoption of new trends uh, to see suit the you know uh, local and the global uh, requirements if you look at the deficiencies of traditional education system though it was doing well but not uh, you know uh, shooting to the current trends particularly from the r&d perspective and also from the uh, industrial perspective if you look at uh, curriculum aspects it was a rigidly structured curriculum process uh, you know with less uh, stakeholder participation uh, in the decision making process and you see it laid an emphasis on academic education which resulted in the development of uh, skills being uh, neglected then uh, it, it was an inflexible uh, and uh, you know prescriptive curriculum prescriptive curriculum and it was on the trends to where the learner achievement was compared to that of other learners and this resulted in unnecessary excessive competition among the uh, students and it was uh, norm referenced where by learner achievement was compared uh, with these students and uh, there is a gap between the formal education and uh, Uh, training for a career, and then testing of learner achievement in terms of the symbols or marks were often not a true reflection of the learner's actual performance. Uh, then, you look, if you look at uh, emphasis was on uh, differentiation in the form of a broad variety of subjects, and uh, then you see a teacher-centered rather than a learner-centered classroom approach uh, was basically applied in the traditional system that you have. and it was a content based curriculum where by the teacher instructed and the learner uh, uh, is uh, you know uh, asked to memorize and uh, lack of collaboration and uh, group learning that you see and uh, improper alignment between objectives activities and uh, assessments and uh, lack of emphasis on the soft skills particularly which are required for the jobs like uh, communication skills interpersonal skills analytical skills then uh, attitude all these things are the some of the you know uh, disadvantages to you see but uh, look at the system 20 30 years back they were uh, suited to the you know those uh, lines of industries and uh, uh, global scenario but if you look at the present scenario then obviously we will have to have these kind of uh, new changes that are to be required particularly in the context of the uh, outcome based education which will definitely help uh, the workforce who are going to get graduated are we in the process of graduation uh, they can solve the you know problems they will apply critical thinking they will have the design thinking uh, they will be able to you know visualize themselves and uh, it will help them to have the ongoing learning and uh, it is creative and uh, it will definitely have the above average communication skills for everybody and uh, it is in line with the new technological developments which are developing getting developed across the globe and uh, it is quite flexible and uh, it uh, allow participate in management processes and uh, decision making and uh, it can also work uh, interactive so these are the some of the advantages which you can see in the outcome based uh, education particularly when you look at the learner specific learner centric uh, uh, paradigms and educational system you see after uh, by you know importing this outcome based education you will find the uh, you can see that learners are active and learners are assisted on an ongoing basis and you will also see the critical thinking reasoning reflection and actions are encouraged then you will also find the content is integrated and learning is relevant and connected to uh, real life situations then learning is uh, learner centered and the teacher facilitates and constantly applies the group work and team work to consolidate the new approaches and learning programs are seen as guides that allow teachers to be more innovative and more creative in designing their uh, programs as well and learners are, take the responsibility for their own learning and who are motivated by feedback and uh, affirmation of their uh, work
Yeah, so focus, uh, if you look at the focus and benefits of the outcome-based education, you'll see, uh, you know, uh, we'll answer some of the key important questions to this outcome-based uh, education. Uh, what do we want the students to have? Are we able to do after the graduation? Then how can we best help the students to achieve it? And how will we know whether the students have achieved it or not? And how do we close the loop for further uh, continuous quality improvement uh, by the students. So I'm sure this outcome-based uh, framework, though it was started in sometime in 1989, so for the past one decade, uh, it has become active from the Indian context. Uh, I'm sure all of you would uh, have a wonderful sessions because wonderful uh, um, uh, speakers and resource persons have been uh, drafted for this program. Uh, I'm sure all of you can understand the very uh, basic terminology of COs, POs, POs, uh, PSOs, and things like that. And um, uh, my, my appeal to all the delegates uh, is, uh, you know, you practice them. See, you find a lot of documentation available on that, a lot of number of resources available, even the, uh, you know, resource persons and keynote speakers will definitely uh, impress you uh, in terms of you know how best you can you can get involved yourself in practicing them. But what is uh, you know uh, important from the perspective of you know outcome based education is uh, it's true implementation at the ground level. All the teachers should practice this, and you know whatever the documentation required and whatever the practices are required, every teacher should follow them. Then only you will understand the spirit of. Uh, outcome based education if you are trying to do this only for the sake of documentation uh, the whole purpose is defeated so what is essentially required is that i also request uh, uh, you know the uh, organizers to have a session on how to practice since it is a kind of workshop also uh, if there is a session arranged to see that you know they take their subject and they also do some exercise on that uh, so that they can also come up their own, uh, you know, uh, doubts and uh, clarifications required. Uh, from that perspective, the teachers would be enabled, uh, they themselves would be able to, you know, uh, make uh, all the concepts that they learn, they'll try to implement them and they'll try to uh, practice uh, them. So as uh, rightly mentioned by the chief guest and chairman of AICT, the accreditations are playing a very, very important role in the uh, national and also in the global context. So obviously, uh, one has to concentrate on the quality aspects of the every step that we take, particularly in the educational institutions. We are the one of the very, very important stakeholders in training the human resource. And uh, whatever the training, whatever the mindset and whatever the attitude that you give to the students uh, in the institution will remain for the rest of the life. So it is our uh, responsibility to see that, you know, we produce the uh, the best uh, educational resource from the respective uh, institutions. So this would definitely help the, uh, you know, uh, present generation and the generations yet to come uh, to see that, you know, we, we uh, have a, a special symbol and a special space in the globe. As we have the 65% of uh, our, uh, you know, population is young and we represent, uh, you know, uh, demographic dividend. And I'm sure all of you would definitely uh, take the advantage of this and try to, you know, uh, you know, excel in those lines. I would also request the organizers to have one session on universal human values, uh, which would also, as rightly mentioned by the uh, chairman AICT, though we have the three-week uh, student induction program, uh, there are also a number of uh, programs being uh, initiated by AICT, particularly uh, through NCCIP, uh, which is, uh, you know, need of the hour on universal human values. I would also request all the delegates to have utilize this opportunity of the lockdown. There are a number of such programs being organized. Even I also participated in a uh, five-day uh, uh, workshop on incorporating the human, universal human values in technical education. Uh, we are also establishing a universal human values cell in our university, and uh, shortly will also circulate to all the colleges to you know have a universal human value cell in the respective colleges and also to identify a coordinator who can in turn uh, coordinate the activities and by 2023 all the teachers should be trained uh, you know with this universal uh, human value dimension so if everybody is trained in those lines i am sure uh, we'll find a, a different generation uh, which will have uh, you know a lot of uh, difference and you know uh, will 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 uh, represent the globe 
with our own uh, human uh, value system i would also take this opportunity to convey to all of you that you know there is also a program uh, from the university that uh, chancellor connect program which has been circulated to all the colleges to see that students are encouraged to give their ideas uh, writings some kind of you know innovations uh, even poems in the context of the present uh, covid 19 lockdown and uh, try to find some kind of solutions and motivate uh, in terms of providing better uh, literature and uh, uh, other associated activities as rightly mentioned by your uh, dean this arogya setu app, app also see that you know all the faculty and all the students all the family members uh, you know use uh, download that uh, arogya setu app and uh, use it for the benefit of you and also for the for the benefit of others i with these few remarks i once again congratulate the entire team of this uh, uh, global uh, institute of engineering and technology i also congratulate all the delegates in spite of you know your own preoccupations uh, you could come here and uh, try uh, trying to participate for these three days i my heartiest congratulations all of you and i also thank the organizers uh, for giving me this opportunity uh, i wish uh, you know this sessions would go though there are some teething problems in terms of the audio and video sometimes in connectivity but i, I request the uh, you know host institution to see that you know they, these problems are solved and uh, uh, you know smooth uh, conduct of program will go on i once again compliment all of you and i thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity thank you very much thank you so much sir now i request mrs yeah. p udeshi assistant yeah. professor to introduce the resource person professor dr p shankar babu professor of trip we are Good morning to dignitaries and all the fellow participants from various colleges. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. P. Shankar Babu Sir. So, working as a professor in Tripoli Department, SVR Engineering College, he has 13 years of academic, administrative, and research experience, and he has greatly contributed for the roles of head of the department in Electrical Engineering and Dean. Sir reviewed two textbooks. He has published more than 55 research papers in reputed international national journals and presented papers in international national conferences also. Sir completed one UGC research project worth of 26.5 lakhs. Sir published three patents and its approval is on process. With these few introductory words, we welcome you, sir. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now, request Mr. Fazlur Rahman Babul, Assistant Professor, to introduce the resource person, Professor Dr. V. Bhagya Raju, Professor of ECE, GNTC, Hyderabad. Please, sir. Good morning to the dignitaries and all the fellow participants from various colleges. It is my privilege to introduce Dr. B. Bhagya Raju, sir. Dr. B. Bhagya Raju, sir, is a working. in guru nanak institution of technical sir has done his be from usman university mtech and phd from jntuh sir has got a total of 20 years rich academic and industrial experience published many papers patents and got many funding project to his credit sir has been associated with the iete hyderabad from past 13 years and served in different capacities presently working as a chairman membership sub centers isf activities iete hyderabad for the term 2018 to 2020 with this few words welcome you sir thank you so much sir now i request mrs anwar jahan assistant professor to introduce the resource person professor g ahmed zishan sir head department of ec and coordinator iqac giit please ma'am a very good morning to everyone present here in the panel and the participants from various colleges william arthur ward a famous author said a good teacher can inspire hope ignite the imagination and instill a love of learning this statement is true with professor g ahmed zishan mr g ahmed zishan is an engineering educator and researcher focusing on teaching through interactive methodologies so her subjects of interest covers digital electronics signal processing instrumentation and control wireless communication sensor networks internet of things and artificial intelligence 
Currently, sir is working as head Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering at GIET and has a rich teaching experience of more than a decade. Sir has chaired sessions in national conferences. Sir received the Certificate of Appreciation IEEE in the year 2015. Sir, sir has around 40 papers in referred national and international journals to his credit. Sir has been to Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, and Thailand on academic visits. As teaching is his passion, Sir is much inclined towards outcome-based education. Sir introduced Electronics Carnival, the enlightened talents in the department for the students in the year 2018 and is the director of the Electronics Carnival. He constituted the Department Ac Academic Council in the year 2016, which conducts numerous co-curricular activities for students. His latest initiative is training the department faculty through STCs, FDPs, in collaboration with NITRTR Chandigarh to develop an aptitude for research and development. Sir is the recipient of Adarsh Acharya Award by the Principal Secretary, Higher Education, Government of Andhra Pradesh. Sir is coordinator, IQAC, and governing body member of Global Institute of Engineering and Technology. With these few introductory words, we welcome you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Now I request Ms. Imroz Basha, Assistant Professor, to introduce the resource person, Mrs. Nuzut Anissa Begum, Associate Head, Department of EC and SPOC NPTEL GIT. Please, ma'am. Good morning, dignitaries and all the fellow participants from various colleges. Mrs. Nuzut Anissa is Assistant Professor and Associate Head, Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering at Global Institute of Engineering and Technology. Madam is an engineering educator with half a decade of experience focusing on teaching through interactive methodologies. She is one among the active student coordinator and has guided many, many as well as major projects. Madam has done her master's and bachelor's both from Ismania University. Ma'am has multiple certifications from NPTEL and publications as well. Her area of interest includes wireless and mobile communications, machine learning, artificial neural networks, support vector machine, and outcome-based education. She has organized numerous guest lectures and workshops. She was the coordinator of Electronics Cardinal, The Enlightened Talent, 2019. Madam is a life member of Indian Society for Technical Education, also spoke of GIET for NPTEL. With these few words, we welcome you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Now, I request Mrs. Anwar Jaha, Assistant Professor, to introduce the resource person, Mrs. P. Sai Leela Vaishnavi, Head, Department of Civil Engineering, GIT. Please, ma'am. Good morning, one and all. Mrs. P. Sai Leela Vaishnavi is currently rendering her services as Senior Assistant Professor and Head, Department of Civil Engineering at Global Institute of Engineering and Technology. Madam has completed her undergraduation B.Tech in Civil Engineering from SS Institute of Technology with distinction and stood as topper of her badge. She has completed her post-graduation in Geotechnical Engineering from Malaradi Engineering College, Campus 1, also with a distinction. Mrs. Vaishnavi has started her career at SS Institute of Technology and worked for colleges like Malaradi Engineering College, Netaji Institute of Engineering and Technology, and joined GIET in the year 2014 as associate head. She also rendered her services as junior engineer at Vista Core Infra Projects, Pune, and estimator of Charita Industrial Designers, Hyderabad. Madam has also worked as trainer for various competitive examinations like GATE and PSUs for subjects geo geotechnical engineering and environmental engineering. Her research interests include Geo-environmental engineering, remediation of contaminated sites, advanced geotextile applications, earth retaining geotechnical systems, stability of high slopes in residual soils, consolidation and strengthening of clays, development of biofilter landfills, and soil structure interaction. She has guided around 30 UG projects and 12 PG projects. Madam has held various academic and administrative roles in her tenure of working at Global and has taken various active qualitative initiat uh, initiatives for the development of department under her headship. She is a calligraphy expert, a tattoo artist, and a plant lover. 
She has been the co-convener of National Level Techno Cultural Fest or SA conducted by GIET for five consecutive years. She loves adding a creative dimension to her work and passion, and she motivates students towards being responsible towards environment. With these few introductory words, we welcome you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Now I request Mr. K. M. Manajudin, sir, Director, Global Professional Co Colleges, to address the gathering. Please, sir. I request Mr. K. M. Anajuddin, sir, Director, Global Professional Colleges, to address the gathering. Please, sir. Thank you, sir. Now I request Mr. Khaja Fasihuddin, sir, Deputy Director, Global Professional Colleges, to speak few words. Please, sir. A very good morning to all the dignitaries. I am truly humbled and honored to have heard and uh, watched Professor Anil Sahasrabuddhi, sir, uh, speaking in a session organized by us. It, uh, he is an epitome of uh, work ethic, and he is a modern-day legend in the education circles in India. A uh, most hearty welcome to Professor Govardhan, sir, rector and in charge registrar of JNTUH, and all the dignitaries, the resource persons, Professor Anil, uh, Professor Arun uh, Tangirala, Prof. 
Professor Shankar Babu, Professor Bhagya Raju, uh, Professor Amar Zeeshan, Mrs. Nuzutun Nissa, Mrs. Sailila Vaisnavi, Mrs. Ishrat. It is a very good initiative taken by Department of Electronics uh, and Communication Engineering in GIET. And I have seen the work put, the, uh, put uh, behind the scenes for this, uh, for, for this uh, workshop. And credit has to go to the department faculty and the HOD. Once again, uh, the points being made by Professor Sahasrabuddhi on the importance of accreditation and Professor Govardhan uh, on the important, uh, importance of outcome-based education uh, is truly overwhelming because as a product of the institution I am a director of now, it is uh, a very uh, emotionally very close to my heart the way uh, teaching is done in the institution, the way students are passing out of the institution and the results uh, which are obviously which is outcome-based education. So it is truly heartening and overwhelming for me, for you all, the people, the higher-ups, the people in positions of authority to share the same views and the same mindset. And thank you so much uh, to the AICT chairman and the rector and in charge registrar of JNTUS to be joining us. And once again, congratulations to the department of EC and all the resource persons. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Now I request Professor Dr. K. Shivalingam, Professor of Civil Engineering and Principal, Global Institute of Engineering and Technology to address the gathering. Please, sir. So, uh, I think there's some technical issue. Now, I request Mrs. Nuzit Anissa, Associate Head EC, to propose word of thanks and mark the conclusion of inaugural session. Please, ma'am. Thank you, Afi, for having been asked uh, to propose the vote of thanks. Uh, I, on behalf of organizing team of uh, the three-day faculty okay. development program, outcome-based education and importance of accreditation to enhance the quality of technical education, thank our chief guest, Professor Anil D. Sahastrabhude, Chairman AICT New Delhi, guest of honor, Dr. A. Govardhan, director and uh, registrar in charge, JNTU Hyderabad, Professor Anil Arun K. Tangirala, sir, for taking out their valuable time with us uh, for this inaugural part. Um, I would take this opportunity to th thank our management, our secretary, sir, director, sir, deputy director, sir, for their constant support, our dean, head, uh, head of the department, and all, all the organizers involved in making this inaugural a success. I wish all the participants a very happy learning. Thank you. Thank you one and all. Uh, now uh, we have session of our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Arun Ketangirala, sir. Sir, over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me check that I'm audible. Are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's great uh, to be a part of uh, this three-day FDP. Uh, uh, it, in fact, the invitation came to me in a different context. Uh, the invitation was uh, to talk about research. But then I had suggested that more than research, I think the need of the hour is teaching. And naturally, when somebody wants to be a good teacher, over a period of time, they realize that they have to be a good researcher. You don't have to publish papers. I don't mean by researcher, I don't mean that you have to publish papers. So uh, thanks a lot uh, for inviting me to this FDP. And it's great to be 
amidst the presence of uh, great dignitaries including dr anil sastrabuddhe dr govardhan and all the other uh, distinguished uh, guests of the day so let me uh, share my presentation first to get started uh is the screen uh, visible to all of you yes sir yes sir screen is visible yes sir yes sir right thank you very yes, much so screenshots or send the notes i'm sorry uh, are you able to see the transitions yeah we can see, see sir but uh, will you share this uh, slide yes i will share Later the slides on. after the talk yes i will i will yeah yeah, yeah. Please, uh, you don't have to uh, really take the pains of capturing the presentation so i uh, if if you have uh, experience any disturbance if you experience any disturbance during my presentation please feel free to uh, let me know so i would like to uh, talk about effective teaching in educational institutions and uh, although i would uh, i will perhaps focus on engineering education the concepts that i am going to speak on are equally applicable to non engineering domains as well so if you are um, a participant actually participating <coughs> from non engineering departments then also a lot of the concepts that i am going to speak should apply all right so let me uh, share a few personal thoughts here before i get started into the full talk now uh, teaching has been one of my childhood passions and i pursued it with uh, great zeal and uh, certainly with uh, with god's grace i am in a profession that i really cherished right from my childhood so the points that i'm going to make are not from any formal teaching training that i have had most of us do not have any formal training in teaching but today there are a lot of teaching and learning centers uh, at iit madras we have a teaching learning center that does offer from time to time programs for formally getting trained in teaching and there is a certain jargon and language that is used in formal uh, teaching programs i may not be using that a lot of the points that i'm going to share are from my own experiences and uh, roughly i've had about i would i should say 15 to 20 years of teaching experience and i've taught uh, not only in india but in other countries so i had the privilege of seeing different audiences and a lot of the points that i'm going to make are based on what i have observed in different audiences with different audiences in different settings i have also had the privilege of teaching not just the classroom sessions but online teaching short term workshops industrial participants and working executives and so on so there has been uh, a wide variety of audience in my uh, in my teaching sessions so let me uh, share a brief outline of the talk i would like to ask i would like to begin the talk by asking what constitutes teaching right a lot of us do call ourselves teachers but at some time it's perhaps a good idea to ask what constitutes teaching and then of course what is involved in teaching it's a very related question it's a corollary where we will talk about communication skills pedagogical aspects evaluation and so on i would like to briefly spend some time on engineering education what are the present needs and then uh, briefly talk about computational pedagogy this has got to do with using computational tools in classrooms and i would also like to take this opportunity to introduce a concept known as soft teaching or soft learning it's my own coining 
term i mean i have coined the term uh, it's not a formal term that's available in the teaching literature and in the midst of this i will uh, refer to a couple of examples at least to convey my points and then i'll close the talk with a few remarks there are of course a few images and cartoons that i've used in this presentation which have been borrowed from open resources and i gratefully acknowledge uh, all the resources so let's start off by asking what constitutes teaching right and in my opinion each of us has an opinion has a definition of what is teaching so i'm just sharing my opinion in my opinion teaching is a holistic exercise number 1 so that's very very important it's not a one dimensional exercise as many think it to be right when somebody says i'm going to apply for a teacher's position i ask at least a few students or a few aspirants what do you think is teaching well they are at loss of words but they do reveal at some point in time that it's all about uh, going and giving out some notes uh, of a, for a particular subject now unfortunately it is not that one dimensional teaching is a holistic exercise and it's very importantly a service so firstly it's a service and to do this service we require both art and science so which means that there are uh, the science part of us of the teaching tells us how we can go about doing certain things but the art part of it says that you will have to learn by practice and that there is a certain creativity there is a certain innovation to it and so on and then there that there is a certain craft so obviously like any other art whether you take music dance and so on some people are born they have innate talent of teaching while some others learn it by practice that's true of any art and teaching is no exception in regards to that so let's uh, remember at least in my opinion the teaching is a service an art and a science okay? the science part of the teaching is what is taught in many formal teaching programs i will briefly touch base on that and i will talk about the art part of the uh, teaching and of course service is obvious i think there is no need to talk about it because teachers really shape the lives of people and i would say that primarily the school teachers are the ones that are foremost in that regard because they are shaping the lives of people when uh, in their formative years right and of course undergraduates also are shaped but i think at the school level the grassroots teaching is extremely important and if you are a school teacher in this participant i don't know or if you have anyone who knows is a school teacher then there is the, uh, the ideas that i'm going to talk about are equally applicable to school teaching as well okay so there are some misconceptions common misconceptions about teaching for example people uh, there are a few who think that reading out a textbook in a class amounts to teaching then there are a few others was in involved in tech sir. i'm sorry your slides not visible sir uh, are you able to see the slide now ah yes sir yes sir you, thank you yeah it looks like if i put it in full screen uh, there is a problem just uh, so okay, i will okay thank you sir. yeah thanks for letting me know. that's what i asked you earlier the people earlier so okay let me do this so are the slides visible now yes sir okay yes sir Fine. sure sure thank you all right so um so what i uh, unfortunately with this the animations are not going to be in place uh, that is the unfortunate part of it uh, perhaps i can me 
see if I can. Because I had some animations in here. Let's see if I can actually get the animations in place. Just a minute, please. some issue with the sharing so we can see your screen your screen is visible to us sir are you able to see now? Yeah, we can see your screen. Are you able to see the? Yeah. Are you able to see the slide? Yes, yes sir. Screen share yes, is sir. on. We can see your screen. Okay, so you are able to see a slide that uh, has the title "What Constitutes Teaching," yes. right? Exactly. Yes, okay. sir. And you are able to see the uh, bulleted items appearing yeah, one after the other. Okay. Yeah, one That's by great. one. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. So let me continue uh, where I left off. So uh, quite a few teachers think that copying equations onto a notebook and reproducing them on board is a big part of teaching, right? Uh, or is a, uh, forms the most part of the teaching. And so they are busy writing down equations into the notebook and then reproducing them on the board. Now for, for a few others, it appears that providing lecture notes constitutes teaching. Now, I keep saying these are misconceptions for a reason. I'll tell you shortly. And for a few others or several of us completing the syllabus, so you see in the schools and in the engineering education, everywhere, there is this mad rush to complete the syllabus. And completing the syllabus amounts to teaching. I'm done with my teaching today, which means that I'm done with my syllabus today. Unfortunately, it is equated to that. And... For uh, many of us, giving out homework and conducting tests constitutes a big part of teaching, right? Now, unfortunately, none of these is solely teaching. In fact, perhaps all of this and something very importantly, additionally, constitutes teaching. So teaching uh, just does not involve reading out a textbook or providing lecture notes or conducting tests. As I said, it's a holistic exercise. And one should remember teaching is not a courier service. In other words, many of us think that there is a textbook that I have uh, prescribed for a course and taking a class today essentially amounts to taking notes from the particular chapter of the textbook, writing it on a piece of paper or copying it onto your laptop and then uh, either writing on the blackboard or projecting on the screen. Then there would be very... Um, minute difference or minor differences between a teacher and a courier person, right? All that we are doing is a postman's job. We're just taking the material from the book, writing onto the blackboard, and then what the student does is takes the material from the blackboard, writes onto his or her notes, and then things are done. So 
now the teacher is neither a book reader so you can see in many descriptive forms of courses a teacher comes to the class with an with a book and reads out and fortunately that is also not the job of a teacher that is not the only thing that is just a very small tiny part of it so what is involved in teaching is what you want to ask well the first thing that or you would say the first element of teaching is the learner so as dr anil sahasr budde mentioned today and others have also spoken we should move away from a teaching centric or a class taking centric system to a learner centric system it is not that we do not know it is somehow that it has been misunderstood for ages that all teaching amounts to is finishing the syllabus giving out lecture notes whereas the focus should be on the learner when we are preparing for a class and that's extremely important just as a sportsman prepares for a test match or for a uh, for any other game what is important is that the teacher prepares and when the teacher prepares for a class the first person that should come in mind is the learner who is learning what is the age group uh, what is their background right what are the prerequisites for the learner all of this one has to ask and we should know our learners so remember that in a class we are not just going to have one student we are going to have many many students then one has to ask whether this particular class that i am preparing for the material the plan that i have lesson plan is it for a few learners bright learners in the class or uh, mediumly performing uh, students or the students who are at the bottom rung of the performance ladder whom is this class aimed at so that's the, that's there is a big discussion on that but the first thing that should be kept in mind is the learner and then the second thing is what do i want to convey what is the message so today's lesson may be on differential equations or it could be on uh, the strength of materials or it could be uh, some you know biological system doesn't matter so there is a concept there is a message that i want to convey so what is it that i want to convey what needs to be taught today now when we talk of when we think of what needs to be taught unfortunately because of our of our years of habituation we always think in engineering for example in terms of what equations should i teach today what theorem should i teach today or what formula should i give out to the students that is not what one has to think as a teacher if a student thinks that way it's okay but not when a teacher thinks that way teacher has to first think of what concepts have to be conveyed to the student and a concept always is formless a concept always is formless for example sweet is a concept when sweet takes the form of a laddu or of any other dessert then it has a certain form to it so a concept is formless now this formless thing should be the focus for the teacher but while delivering we will have to give it in the form of something right so if i tell a child this is sweet the child doesn't understand but because sweet is an abstract thing is a very formless thing concepts are also abstract so what do i do for the child i, I give a gulab jamun or i give a laddu or i give a barfi or i give some sweet some dessert then the child understands the concept but not fully the child thinks that oh sweet means always gulab jamun but then one has to take the child slowly into other aspects and show that the sweet doesn't mean necessarily gulab jamun it could mean something else also could mean kheer it could mean anything so once a child is exposed to different forms of the concept then the child learns to distinguish between the concept and the form which means in engineering education the student learns to distinguish between the concept and the equation equation is a language 
of expressing the concept. You may use Greek symbols, Greek symbols today. Hundred years later, you may be using Devanagari symbols or some other language. That doesn't matter, but the concept will be the same. The form in which it is being expressed. So the teacher needs to focus on the message, on the concept that has to be conveyed. Then there is an objective, right? So today uh, the FTP is an outcome-based education, and this objective is very, very important in teaching. Teaching in an aimless fashion is just plain discussion. That is not teaching. It is just plain discussion uh, without uh, any particular focus. But classroom teaching is a fairly serious affair. There should be an objective, and there are intermediate objectives. There are short-term objectives, and then there are long-term objectives. So there is an objective for the overall course. Then there is an objective for you know one month of the course. There is an objective for that week. There is an objective for the class. So one has to look at all the objectives. And objectives again have to be learner centric. Objective cannot be I have to finish this. No, objective has to be of the form students should learn this. If they learn this now, they are in a position to learn this later on. Two classes later, some other concept would appear, and therefore I better prepare them now. So objectives, when stated, should not be on what we are trying to finish. What we are trying to complete objective should be on what the students should be learning, and then there is a setting that is you want to ask whether you are teaching in a classroom, whether you are uh, where you you have a lot of time to go into details, or you are teaching a very condensed or a compressed course, or you are teaching industrial participants, and so on. So the environment, the learners' background. Everything has to be taken into account. So, a, a teaching involves the learner, the concept, the objective, and the setting, right? And the teacher. So, remember, I didn't talk about the teacher in teaching because the teacher is the one who is going to do all of this. So, the teacher is the one who communicates a message or a concept or imparts a skill to a learner. So that he or she understands that particular concept, masters the skill. If it is a you know a vocational course, for example, or a laboratory course, and if needed, applies it to solve problems, develop technology, conduct research, improve life, etc. So where the student applies is purely a matter of time. But the student should be prepared for all of that, and. Where do we check if the student is ready for taking things what they have learned, what he or she has learned, and applying? Is something that I'll talk about. But this is what is a teacher. So you can see a lot of things have to be kept in mind by a teacher. And in addition, a teacher is a guide and a role model also. That's very very important. Many people think that. I am here to teach only communication theory in electrical engineering, or I'm uh, as a civil engineer. I'm only going to teach uh, structural uh, properties of materials or buildings, or as a chemical engineer, I'll teach only fluid mechanics. Doesn't matter. So the teacher is not just going to teach a subject. The teacher serves as a guide also. Because let me emphasize this part and mention this: um, whatever concepts we teach today. Whatever formulae that we teach today, they may have their expiry date in terms of memory. The student may not be able to recollect. How many of us are able to recollect what our teachers have taught us in the high school or in engineering? Even our most favorite teachers, we don't remember necessarily the formulae because that's a matter of being uh, using it in a routine way or a repeated way. If we don't use it, it generally falls into the back seat and vanishes. But what we remember. Our teachers for is how they responded to critical situations, how they handled students who were really troublesome, how when we did a mistake, our teachers guided us or reprimanded us or corrected us, and in what way they conducted themselves. 
So the lo long term role for a teacher is a guide and a role model. Many faculty colleagues whom I have interacted with and I continue to interact with believe that they are not qualified. No, that is not correct at all. As teachers, as, as much as we think we are qualified for teaching a subject, it becomes our unwritten responsibility to serve as a guide and a role model, which means that we have to practice values and if needed, instill values in our students. And we should not hesitate to do that, right? And always let us remember that one cannot show others what one cannot see. So if this applies to both subject and values, if I have very limited vision of the subject, then I will not be able to guide the student. Likewise, if I do not have a lot of values in mind, if I am not following a lot of principles, then I, I will not be able to guide. So which means that the, on the teacher, there is a lot of responsibility and onus to have a wide perspective of the subject and also practice a lot of values, a lot of principles that are useful in long term. Okay, so we have talked about what does teaching involve, right? Let's now, in that regard, talk about certain ingredients of teaching. So I would like to think of the teaching ex exercise itself. I can give you an analogy like as a cooking exercise, right? When I sit down to cook, I have an objective, right? I want to cook some dish. It's not that I'm going to go into the kitchen and uh, let's figure out what dish comes out. I'll pour everything into the pan you know, on the, and keep it on the stove. Let us see. I will eat whatever comes out. Obviously, you never do that. As in cooking, you start off with objectives. Today, I'm going to make paneer butter masala or I'm going to make biryani or I'm going to make a uh, sandwich, whatever it may be. So there, are, there should be clear outcomes in mind. In When it comes to teaching, as I said, it should be learner-centric objectives. Have clear outcomes in mind. What you want the student to learn today, to what detail, because usually the teacher will have more knowledge than the student, and teaching is not about dumping whatever we know onto the student, right? So we have to have clear objectives in mind. And then we will first have to learn what we want to teach. That's extremely important. Now, this may sound a bit insulting. No, it isn't. Teaching the other side of teaching coin is learning. We are both teachers and learners. Unless we learn, we will not be able to teach. And very importantly, while learning, whatever difficulties we encounter are the same difficulties the students are going to encounter, or perhaps even more, because we have had years of experience with some related subjects, and we may be able to find um, it easy to overcome those difficulties, whereas the students are beginners. So it's quite important to remember the difficulties, the sweat we gave out while learning a concept so that we make it easy for the student to understand. So the once the objectives are set out, we should ask whether we have the requisite knowledge for the subject to teach. Now, many people typically stop at learning. Unfortunately, they stop with learning and then they go to the classroom straight away to deliver. But as you will see in this slide, it is only the first step. The second step in teaching is research. Now, the moment somebody hears the word research, they start thinking of a lab, of publishing papers, doing literature review, and all of that. No, the research that is required for teaching has got to do with studying the concept in breadth and depth. So, yes, there is a literature review. One has to see, suppose I'm teaching how to solve a differential equation, right? I take my textbook, the reference textbook, and I learn how to solve a differential equation as given in the textbook, and note down a few examples and go to the class and do. That is what is an unfinished job of preparation. The, the more complete one is to go to the net and ask, what are the different ways of solving a differential equation? Because all the methods that are available may not be there in the textbook, number one. Secondly, we should have a certain vision. As I said, unless we have the, the breadth and depth in mind, we cannot show the students. And we are not going to show the entire breadth and depth. 
but there are some students that are going to test you that they're going to ask you in the class questions that would be either a deep profound or broad at that time we should be in a position to answer it's not a matter of ego but it's a matter of being responsible so one of the key ingredients of teaching is carrying out research knowing different viewpoints of the same concept figuring out the best way of teaching a concept also what may be given in the textbook need not be the best way once you have assimilated the knowledge and done your research with the objective in mind then comes communicating right so it's like you cooked your dish you have learned what it makes to uh, prepare this what it takes to prepare the dish what are the different way, flavors of this dish how it can be prepared then it is time to serve this dish now obviously cooking tasty food is not necessarily going to imply that you are going to serve in a correct way i can cook a lot of tasty food and keep it on the plate and say eat and go away obviously that is not the correct way we should also learn to serve communicate and in teaching communication is at the heart if we know a lot i may be an ex- i may be a vidwan i may be an excellent researcher but if i cannot communicate what i know then unfortunately the vehicle of teaching com- uh, comes to a complete halt so what is involved in communication contextualizing what you want to present storytelling analogies systematic delivery so let me give you an example in electrical engineering we here uh, we learn this concept of communication which we today use in mobiles all communication devices such as radios mobiles telephones tel- televisions and so many other devices we learn a principle of communication in electrical engineering in a formal way that the messenger signal the message that has to be conveyed uh, is convey is wrapped in a messenger signal so there is a message there is a messenger and then the wrapped signal is now transmitted at a certain frequency and the receiving device takes it and removes the messenger part of it and decodes the message for you so there is an encoding at the communicating site transmitting site and then there is a decoding at the recipient site receiving site that is the same principle that we want to apply in teaching and a common example that i give is suppose you take a you know a, a young boy oh, who is in romance and who wants to actually communicate something uh, to a girl uh, on the fifth floor right so let us assume i'm young people do this let's assume a very healthy romance there olden days how do you do it you write on a piece of paper now the piece of what you write on the piece of paper is a message but the paper cannot fly up to the fourth or the fifth floor so what do you do well the olden uh, and the golden idea tied to something like a stone or something solid which can fly and throw it don't do don't practice this in today's uh, age and time but i'm just giving an analogy that people keep trying and the person at the receiving end should know the difference between the message and the carrier the carrier is the stone or the hard object and the message is the paper if the carrier confuses one for the other then there is a problem so one has to do the same thing here in teaching there is a concept that i want to convey and i want to wrap it you see this happening in primary schools in kindergartens everywhere that there is a concept you want to wrap it in a certain story or in a certain context and then communicate that to the student so that there is no loss of the message because we know from electrical engineering that if the message signal is transmitted as is it cannot travel long distances it dies down very soon likewise when i am as a teacher communicating a certain concept i'll have to wrap it in a wrapper and communicate it to the student and also tell the student the difference between the wrapper and the content and over a period of time the student understands that yes 
you are wrapping it but the concept is the one that is of interest so communication is an extremely critical and integral part of teaching and not every concept be taught the same way be communicated the same way certain concepts you can use computational tools certain concepts you can use analogies certain concepts you can use storytelling and so on but overall there has to be a systematic delivery so if i have cooked five dishes and i want to serve my guest five dishes yes you know i will build a story around it and i will serve but i will serve in a certain sequence so that the guest enjoys it likewise when i am going to teach three or four concepts in a week i have to plan it i have to systematically deliver so that the student learns it it is not about telling the student what we know it is about teaching the student what they need to learn and that requires organization which means that you have to plan one has to figure out how many after how many lectures or within a lecture when do you want to give a break and ask the students to solve an example engage the students in group discussion sometimes ask them to bring their computers if it's a computational course ask them to work on the spot so one has to have a clever mix and that is where the art part of it of teaching is sometimes you may want to engage them in group activity so so many different things you have to try out because the recipe that you have for each course is different you cannot apply the same recipe but the concepts underneath all the recipes are this and then you have evaluation part which is very very important the evaluation in a formal education institution clearly determines what the student is going to learn right after all it's a human psychology if you say that these concepts are not included in the exam 95% of the students will not even care to look at that concept so if you want a certain concept to uh, be taught in a serious way then it has to be a part of your evaluation because once the students know that they are going to be tested on that they will be more serious on it the moment you say this topic is not there then they will not pay attention to so typically in evaluations we give out assignments now i personally i think the homework problems or the assignments that we give out they are more on the learning side rather than the evaluating side they should trigger thinking but in order to give an incentive for them to work out the assignments i have a certain 15% or 10% or 20% but not more than that because i do encourage discussions among the students so in a classroom what happens is different students have different learning abilities so you want to be non uniform you want to really alleviate that non uniformity right and assignments are a good way of bridging that gap ironing out those non uniformities and make sure that you have your assignment problems well thought out they should be in sync with what you are teaching again you don't have to take exercises from the text you can build your own because you know what you have taught the exercises given at the end of the chapter in the text are based on what the author has done how the author has gone about teaching that particular chapter exams are very very important and they should test both the basics and application so exam should be a healthy mix of what one has been taught so it means that um, a student a medium performing uh, you know average student should be able to answer at least half of the paper and the rest of them the brighter the other side of the average the higher side of average people should be challenged in your exam i have always set exam papers where the students are forced to think yes students have complained to me saying that oh this student this question paper is so different from the other questions because i don't have a plug and play type of questions plug and play meaning i know a formula i can apply and solve it i tell them that you won't get to see plug and play questions uh, fully in the exam paper there will be some but you will be asked to think and then answer and usually i give them more time than needed because i tell them that the concern for me is their uh, their knowledge their ability to apply 
rather than solving it in 15 minutes or one hour and so on. So all this, when you put together, constitutes essentially teaching. So that is what, what teaching is. So you can see teaching is a six dimensional, at least uh, exercise. As far as I can see, you can add more dimensions to it, but definitely it is not one dimension. So just learning what you need to teach or setting up question papers or simply planning doesn't constitute teaching. It has to be a mix of all of this and then you will make a very tasty dish. All right. Feel free, please feel free to ask questions between. You don't have to really wait until the end of my talk. So let me actually focus on the communication part here. I've talked about communication and I've said that it's a heart of, at the heart of teaching. And usually I spend more time on that aspect. So let me explain to you with an example what is meant by contextual teaching. And this is more on the mathematics and the engineering side. So obviously if there are participants who are not from the math, uh, and it's a basic math, it is not very complicated math, engineering 101 kind of uh, math. If you are not from that background, yeah, please forgive me for this example. Most of us who have done a math 101 course in engineering must have studied linear algebra or matrix algebra where we talk about the condition number of a matrix. So I'm, I've just taken an example here and let us imagine a typical teaching session. A, the traditional way of teaching this concept of condition number which appears in matrix algebra. If you do not recall what is condition number, you know, you can quickly on your devices go to Wikipedia and search what is condition number. But let me tell you how traditionally 90 to 95 percent or many, many teachers teach this. The first thing that the teacher does is, it says today we are going to learn about condition number of a matrix and here is the formula. The student has no clue why this condition number is being talked about. What is the meaning? What is the reason that we are going to study this? What are its potential uses? Nothing. Straight away, one goes and says, today, okay, children, you're going to learn about condition number, and this is what is the formula. And this is typically for many other uh, concepts as well. So the condition number is the ratio of two quantities and so on, right? Okay, so what exactly is a condition number? Can it be taught in a uh, different way the, rather than just giving a formula for matrix norm? It's a ratio of two matrix norms, norm of the ma given matrix and the norm of the inverse of the matrix. And then you solve a few problems and you say this is how it is. The student hardly will be able to remember this. It becomes a pure, you know, uh, as they say in Hyderabad, Ratmarna exercise or in Hindi, it, it becomes a test for the hard disk. That's it. Because the context, the concept has not been explained. On the other hand, an educative method will first build a context around the problem, introduce the conceptual motivation, and ask a pertinent question, make the students answer using natural and, uh, using natural and logical reasoning, and then establish a concept and finally give the formulae. So there has to be a gradual buildup in that way. So how do you do that? This is, by the way, called inductive learning in teaching circles. So let us, I mean, I, I go to the class and say, well, let's have a nice discussion today to begin with. Consider that I'm buying two items. Each item costs a price. And I, the, the total budget has to be used up. So I have a certain money with me and I have to completely use up that. And I also have to mix these two items that I'm going to buy so that a target taste or composition is achieved by mixing them. So I give the cost. So you can say that 4.1 and 2.8 are the cost of each items. And the total budget that I have is 40.3. And let us say I want to achieve a 95.1% uh, composition or whatever it is by mixing these two items in this ratio okay and i now i ask the question well 
what is the solution to this problem how many how much should I, how many items should i buy anybody with an answer to this question in the meeting right now can anybody solve x1 and x2 for me and give me the answer it's a very simple two equation to unknowns anybody with an answer for this hello Anybody with an answer to this? Hello. Hello. Are you able to hear? Can I check if I'm audible? Hello. Hello. Okay. So anybody with an answer? It's very simple. Don't think this is a JE question. Sorry. It's a it's a nine standard uh, question. Hello. So, so you keep working out the solution. Maybe some of you are hesitant. Uh, to let me know it's a very simple there is a very simple solution to that problem but if you get the solution do let me know now suppose i ask you the question even if you don't know the solution suppose i say that this x is uh, cost here but hello x1 x1 is 3 x2 is 10 excellent very very good thank you thank you very much and uh, who is this man no suresh kumar ola suresh kumar okay thank you very much okay now that uh, one gentleman has answered the question to him and to the rest of the audience suppose i ask a question next question suppose one of these numbers here has a small error in it or uncertainty in it i i typed it wrongly let us say or i got this information in error then do you think so small by small i mean let us say instead of 4.1 it is 4.12 or 4.13 or instead of 9.7 it is 9.68 do you think the solution will change significantly just without resolving it do you think if there is a very small error in these coefficients the solution will change from 3 to 10 to something very different or will it be within the vicinity of it it What will change think? it will change it will change but, but it will change significantly or only by small value a small What value do you think significant significant somebody says small value okay so what is the significant value you can so you we can find a solution again and check if it changes significantly or if it changes by a small value now this is where you can use computational tools to examine effects of uncertainty on this right so it turns out that for this problem even if 
uh, there is a small change in one of the numbers here, 9.7 or 4.1 or 2.8 or 6.6. Even if there is a small change in the number, the solution will change significantly. Now, that is counterintuitive because typically we think if these numbers change only by a small amount, the solution should not change. But there is a certain peculiarity of these equations. And in general, then the question is given two equations like this or many equations and many unknowns, how do I know whether the solution is sensitive to errors in the coefficients? Is the solution highly sensitive or low? Uh, it has a low sensitivity. This is where Typically, I run a MATLAB script. I use MATLAB a lot, but you can use any of the software, R, Python, whatever, to show the different solutions that come about as you change the numbers here. And it turns out that the numbers change quite significantly. So that is where you can use computational tools. And I've, remember, I have not used the term condition number yet. I'm just putting things in a context. And now we are at a stage of sensitivity analysis. So we are asking how sensitive the solution to a set of linear equations is to small changes in coefficients. And essentially that is what condition number tells you. So condition number, of course I'm skipping uh, a, a lot more things that I teach, but what I wanted to establish is, is this educative or inductive method where you start off with the context explain the problem that you are solving and then introduce condition number as a measure of the sensitivity. So it turns out that if I construct a matrix with these numbers 4.1, 2.8, 9.7 and 6.6, .6, a 2 by 2 matrix with these numbers here, it turns out that the matrix is nearly singular, which means its determinant is nearly zero, not exactly zero. So this near singular matrices can cause a lot of problem when you're solving linear equations. And condition number essentially is a measure of how close the matrix is to singularity. Why is that important? Because we use, we solve this set of linear equations in many, many different applications. And it is important to know when we are solving such problems, such linear equations, how sensitive this solution is and condition number straight away tells you that the solution is very sensitive. Therefore, you better be very, very sure about these numbers else the solution is going to change drastically even for a small change in these numbers. When you go through such a discussion, such a developing exercise, the students remember not only the concept of condition number, but also the purpose, the uses, and they know that the issue is not about condition number, the issue is about singularity, near singularity of the matrix, and that there could be other ways of quantifying the near singularity of a matrix and so on. So that is a more uh, appealing approach to teaching any concept. So you start with, uh, with the example and then you go about uh, building the concept, the, uh, getting to the equations and number and the formulae and so on. So the, unfortunately, the current practice in engineering education, so I'll spend about five minutes talking about the current practice, and then I have one more example, and then I'll close the session. Uh, there are a few cartoons that I have, just to lighten up the moments, but those cartoons essentially communicate what I want to communicate. Um, so, how is engineering education taught? The current practice in engineering education is that you have separate subjects on mathematics and sciences, and unfortunately, they are still taught as pure subjects like in the high school, right? There is very little emphasis on applied aspects. Engineering problems are actually blend of math and science. They are not either a math problem or a science problem. And also, it is a very common practice to have theory courses and then you have a lab session in the following semester. Whereas a better way of teaching is to have the lab and theory running in parallel 
and today with the computational tools you can bring the lab to your class what i mean is that you can build a virtual lab in your computer and make the students first go through some examples invoke their curiosity and then establish the theory that is a lot more uh, effective when it comes to teaching and then unfortunately there are pure software courses so there are courses teaching either matlab or r or python aspen comsol whatever your favorite software is and those courses in our opinion uh, in my opinion are of very very little utility software is like an accompanying artist the main artist is the singer the main artist is the con is the concept is a subject software is going to provide means for implementing understanding simulating whatever you have learned so if you are going to teach pure software courses you are stripping away the utility of this software and they will hardly remember anything and it only serves as a filler course in your curriculum unfortunately there is very little or insufficient emphasis on intuition and perspectives i'm going to show a few uh, cart cartoons to that effect the drawbacks of these approaches are that one cannot place mathematics and science in context and and that there is a disconnect between theory and practice and the theory is not understood and practice is boring both are defeated so when you are teaching students are yawning and then they are just uh, you know waiting for the class to get over and they are looking at their clocks or at the phone and then when it comes to lab the following semester they don't remember anything that you have taught and i'm sure these are all familiar experiences to all of us and unfortunately there is graduation without realization right most of us perhaps have gone through that but we don't want the current generation to go through that so let's go through some light moments where there is an obsession of pure subjects teaching without putting them in context right so this is a cartoon that i borrowed from the net and you will appreciate hopefully the humor in this cartoon it says live in concert tonight the mathematics and instead of asking the audience to stand in a queue at the counter in plain language the message says please form a y equals mx plus c so you know what y equals mx plus c is it's a equation of a line so what this cartoon is trying what this cartoon is trying to convey is don't make things more complicated than necessary you can if wherever there is a need to say in plain language do it the second cartoon that i have goes to show unfortunately the plight of the students in the high school you can see at the top they are asked they are shaped in such a way that they are asked to go through a square hole so they come out with a square brain but when they come to engineering or college they are asking the students to go through a circle now we very, very well know you cannot fit a square into a circle like this so the students are baffled as to what is going on before asking them to go through a circle we have to tell them that the different squares that they have now have to be blended and, and the corners have to be shaped and then they are ready to go into a circle otherwise they'll stay as baffled as these kids are and i have another cartoon to emphasize the role of intuition sometimes teachers go excessively in teaching everything the formula way without necessarily appealing to the intuition so in this in, in this cartoon this student here is solving 3x plus 7 equals 7 now intuitively you straight away know x is 0 but because the student has been coached because this is coaching problem in coaching what is taught is a procedure doesn't matter how things are you are asked to follow a certain procedure and the student goes through the procedure and finally realizes oh my god i have done all this for literally nothing the answer was zero which is a trivial answer so this shows the situation of many in many many 
colleges and many many uh, uh, institutions and then finally the uh, story of a person here who has done phd but doesn't know the difference between theory and practice and doesn't know the role of practice so let me quickly go over this cartoon for you so this guy comes here to a dairy farmer and says that in the lab this week he learned how you can get three times much more milk from your cows and the farmer is shocked because the farmer is such an experienced person he is you know he is a dairy farmer this is how can it be possible because he is already running the most productive dairy in the uh, area there in the state well he says look he tells the farmer it's his lucky day and he says there's just a very simple calculation to do that and the farmer is really curious and now comes the most hilarious statement the researcher here says let's assume you have a spherical cow right radiating milk isotropically now that's typically you know when i give this in uh, person i usually see the audience really bursting out in laughter because it is such a theoretical proposition that you cannot have a spherical cow and you cannot have it radiating milk isotropically but that's what happens when too much emphasis is given on theory and too little emphasis uh, mention is made about, about practice so obviously the farmer is shocked so the problem as i say is in high school education they are taught equations they are taught pure sciences they are trained for solving exact and pure problems that means they are not taught about uncertainties whereas in engineering education you are solving a lot of real life problems and with the current engineering education the student waits like somebody like this who is waiting for the day that actually that education is put to use therefore it is important in engineering education to show how math and sciences blend and get into action and very importantly to teach how probability and statistics are useful i am not saying this because i am from a data science uh, background i am saying this because engineers should be equipped to deal with uncertainties they should also know how to how equations get into action i call them equations and also how to estimate parameters so they should know all of that right unfortunately they don't know most of this and that is where that is why a lot of the engineering graduates end up not finding any excitement in engineering or not being potentially employable they lose interest in uh, engineering soon into their first semester so give me a minute here and i'm just charging my battery here All right. So, are you able to see the slides? Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, okay. Right. So. Yes, sir. I'll just take. A, I'll just take a five to seven minutes more. So, what is important? in education apart from changing the curriculum after apart from uh, teaching in a in a inductive way you can also use computational tools today to motivate you can you have today a lot of technology at your disposal 
which was not there 20 30 years ago right so you can introduce like in the condition number example you can use it some turn okay to first introduce a concept of uh, whatever condition number or any other concept that you are teaching or you could use the simulation tool to highlight the problem and then motivate the students to think about the solution and present the solution subsequently that is a lot more effective right and that is what essentially i call as soft teaching or soft learning where you use the soft tools and you introduce the problem with minimal or no equations the problem as is and then that helps them trigger uh, the, uh, trigger their thinking as to what the solution could be after of course you don't want to make them wait too long because there is a time constraint as well but triggering their thinking really helps because after the class they will continue to think and these are this approach of soft teaching or soft learning where you are using computational tools to motivate the problem trigger their thinking is highly useful for math stats and science intent subjects essentially what you are doing is you are taking them through a virtual lab and there is a concept called tpack which essentially integrates technology with pedagogy content and knowledge that is what tpack stands for and it is uh, shown to be highly beneficial in education and this framework was introduced by kohler and mishra and essentially there are three components here there is a pedagogical aspect there is a content and then there is a technology so you put together all these three in a healthy way to do a complete your teaching exercise what happens is with this technology you are able to contextualize what you are teaching right whatever that concept may be and it encourages computational thinking uh, and the computational thinking skills it allows layered learning and there are different forms of technology that you can use you can either use a computational tool or you can use a simulation tool but there are uh, as far as computation simulation are concerned there are many other technologies available so you can use simulations you can use computational modeling you can use mobile devices you can use pedagogic robots which are very very new i wouldn't do that but some people use that because for some courses this pedagogic robotics are very useful or there are some courses which teach through gaming so there there, there is a gaming and technology mediated uh, learning and then there is creative and artistic technology so there are all these different ways of bringing technology into your classroom but for all of this technology or no technology the offline work has to be in place the ground work has to be in place okay so the idea is to replace your experimental demos with simulation typically you start with concepts and perspectives and then you go to theory some people straight away jump to theory that is where the danger is so you want to start off with concepts go through the application route and then present the theory or you can use the experimental or the simulation route and then these are theory and then of course keep shuttling between theory and concept concepts are a high level understanding theory gives the details if you straight away start with details there is an issue so it's important to remember that a lecture is worth 1000 reads somebody has read 1000 pages but maybe listen to one lecture and gain much more knowledge than that a picture is worth 1000 words we have heard about this a simulation is worth 1000 computations simple simulation actually conveys a lot more than what you will have to compute and therefore a healthy blend of technology analogy similitudes theory practice graphics everything makes a complete package and the role of simulations today is much much more than ever before because experiments are risky can be costly simulations are very inexpensive very less risky after all it can only crash a computer that's about it so you want to use simulation to motivate the theory and you also you want to use a simulation to reinforce the theory that you have taught and you can use the simulation tools to also show how theory translates to practice 
so simulations are useful for uh, in a number of different ways right and the most important thing is simulations oppor uh, offers opportunities for innovation and testing that's important so let me conclude with a simple example here uh, i don't know how many of you have heard about the fourier transform uh, but i'm sure those who are in electrical engineering and in engineering must have heard of fourier transform suppose this is the task in hand for a teacher because this is one of the most dreaded concepts in mathematics and electrical engineering and in a few other branches and teachers are usually afraid of teaching this concept or the the way they go about doing is they provide expressions so they give formulae like this here is a discrete time fourier transform this expression here is a discrete time fourier transform and then they also give the uh, the, the this is discrete time fourier series expression this is a discrete time fourier transform and then they they give the parsimonious uh, result here and they you know remember this formula transform essentially allows you to think of a signal in terms of signs and so on without necessarily going through the idea of a transform okay so that is how traditionally fourier transform is introduced let me straight away take you to this slide where i teach fourier transform with an analogy where there are no equations this this some of these slides show you how you can use computational tools to introduce fourier transform i'm skipping that part i only want to talk about the analogy part and then close the discussion okay so how do you teach fourier transform how do you give a motivating start right so what you do is you teach fourier transform with an analogy so what is the analogy that i normally use remember that some of you who have used fourier transforms must have also heard of wavelet transform right let me actually take you there okay so here is where we are suppose i want to teach fourier transform with a real life example that has got nothing to do with mathematics fourier transform is a purely mathematical subject to begin with and then of course applied in signal processing how can we help a student understand or break the ice with regards to this mathematical tool and, and motivate the concept itself what i do is i tell them like any other transform fourier transform is also transform but what is a transform after all? the word transform itself is intimidating to the student and the student thinks this is some exotic exotic or esoteric concept that is only there to torture that person and that so that the student uh, doesn't uh, get good marks but if we are passionate about this transforms and we if we want the student to learn then we use an analogy that analogy is that of laundering your clothes or washing your clothes this can be understood even by a layman what is the analogy here well we do wash our clothes right lockdown or no lockdown we do wash our clothes how do we wash our clothes right we we wish that we can take the cloth and whip it in the air and get rid of the dirt how nice it would be but then that would mean the detergent industry the cloth industry the washing machine industry all of these industries will close down already economy economy is not doing well so maybe we don't want such a, a privilege where i can whip the cloth and get rid of the dirt so what do we do next well we take the clothes and put it in water right the reason is clothes cannot be cleaned in the raw or the air domain 
the dirt and cloth are not separable. That is the main problem that we have with not being able to get rid of the dirt in the air. But the moment I put it, I soak the clothes in water. What I'm doing, I'm actually going from air medium to a water medium. That is essentially the equivalent of transforming a signal. What is the analogy? Well, very often Fourier transforms are used for removing noise from measurements. See, many of the sounds that you were hearing earlier are noisy, right? You may not have heard certain speakers clearly, or you may not be hearing my voice also clearly. So what you're receiving is noisy measurements. But if you have a filter, which works on the principle of Fourier transform, what it would do is it would clean, it would remove the noise from the signal and give it to you. The same, in the same way as what you will do with your clothes, clothes, right? So you soak it in water, there it does a transform, so it does some numerical operation. And in the water, the cloth and dirt are separable. I don't soak my clothes in turpentine or sambar and so on, right? Obviously. I soak it in water because I know water enables good separation of dirt from cloth. So the first step is transform. Then the second step is in the water. Once I soak it in water, let's say I add some detergent, all those operations that I perform, the dirt and cloth have separated very effectively. Then I throw away the dirt and take the wet cloth out. But I can't wear the wet cloth. What I do is, I actually take the wet cloth and dry it. So drying is again going back from water medium to air medium. So that you can think of as an inverse transform. So what has happened in the cloth, cl cloth cleaning example? I have transformed. I have gone from air medium to water medium. I have performed some operations when the cloth is in water. And then... I have done an inverse transform. This is exactly what we do in signal cleaning using Fourier transform. I have a noisy version of the signal. I put it through a Fourier transform. There are a few slides that I have skipped. When you get the slides, please go through the previous slides. It shows how the cleaning is done numerically by the Fourier transform to extract the signal from its noisy measurement. When this example is given, students are able to connect an abstract mathematical concept with a real life example. And that helps you break the ice and grab their attention. Then you can give technical and computational examples uh, also, if you wish, of signal compression, how you can represent a sine wave uh, in which requires a lot of storage versus simply storing amplitude, frequency, and phase, which is only three pieces of information. So it's all about how you represent the signal. Or you can motivate Fourier transform by periodicity detection because everything is periodic in nature. Even the Earth's movement, the planetary movements, the sun, everything, whatever we see is periodic around us. So we need to detect the periodicity of so many phenomena around us. Fourier transform helps us detect. Merely making the statement is not good. You have to show some examples, which is what I've done in the previous slides. But in the interest of time, I have left it that way. So teaching by analogy. So I'm coming to the conclusion. Teaching by analogy is a very powerful way of teaching. And it's not just restricted to engineering. For example, if you are learning or teaching music, you, you, can, you know that our music is based on seven notes and their variants you can think of those as ingredients. So now you can start giving the analogy of cooking or you can give the analogy of driving. So when, when a beginner is learning music, the beginner is asked to hold on to a note as much as possible to hold on to the shruti, that is the pitch throughout the song, just as the way a bicycle rider is supposed to balance the bicycle so long as the person is driving and the better, the, the, the more skilled driver is the one who is able to balance the vehicle while driving slowly. Likewise, a more skilled artist in music is the one who is able to maintain the shruti, the tune, the raga, everything while singing slowly. It's very, very hard 
believe me to sing to maintain that pitch and the tune while singing slowly so you can also think of notes for a song as a philosophy of life the notes stay in the background the song is what you hear the philosophy stays in the background and action is what you see in practice so so many analogies can be given which grasps the attention of the student so let me conclude with this uh, teaching paradigm there are two teaching paradigms broadly speaking uh, there are other paradigms also one takes a bottom up approach of this pyramid and the other takes a top down approach of this pyramid so what is this pyramid well this pyramid consists of applications at the base including that include natural phenomena man made phenomena and so on and then theory at the top which is quite difficult to grasp right so if a person wants to understand the theory the person has to climb a hill to reach the theory the standard practice today in many many institutions including iit everywhere is to first teach theory and then talk about intuition and then show some simulation results and then talk about applications but if you look at the history of how theory evolved it actually evolved the other way around it started by man observing applications natural phenomena right for example uh, people observed the waves of the sea people observed the uh, scattering of light you know how uh, sir cv raman came up with the scattering theory he observed the sky the sky has blue in color so he observed the natural phenomena did some experiments used this intuition and finally came up with the scattering of light theory which got in the nobel prize so when somebody has learned it that way uh, has come up with a theory that way it makes also sense to teach it that way so you start with examples of applications or simulations get, motivate the learner give intuitive ideas in uh, really trigger their intuitive thinking train them and, and train their skills the uh, 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 in terms of thinking abstractly and then come to the theory part so that is called the inductive teaching so the the theory to the applications part is called the deductive teaching whereas inductive teaching is going from application to theory so let me conclude the talk by saying the teaching is not just knowing or delivering what one knows that's very important and that teaching is a multi dimensional exercise it involves our knowledge our perspectives our communication skills learning planning evaluation with an objective and learner at the center so we want to ask from now on as a teacher how many of these dimensions we have really thought about and i bet a lot of us will come back and say i only talk thought about knowledge and perhaps evaluation with a bit of planning that's it the communication part is usually the weakest in teaching and that requires command over the language that requires good command over the subject becoming one with the subject and this is spontaneity is the mark of a good teacher in the class when teachers teach they come up with spontaneous ideas that those are not prepared uh, ideas all of that comes when you are one with the subject and perspectives that comes with research so if you are not having a research career don't worry here is the opportunity to become a researcher by researching what you are going to teach and a layered approach to teaching always helps you you want to start with concepts first and then you want to connect concepts to real life so doing all of this helps and then gradually peel the layer after layer right and as i mentioned earlier evaluation holds the key and i made these points uh, already and i want to close by saying that a teacher's role is not just teaching the subject but also to instill values ethics and healthy practices so with that i will conclude my talk thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to express my thoughts and sharing whatever i feel with you hopefully you benefited from this i am uh, you're most welcome to ask questions i'm open to any questions even today or later thank you hello good afternoon sir yes good afternoon
uh, regarding the pv and this uh, uh, formatting a problem like uh, some subjects will be theoretical and some will be problematic right hello uh, yeah like uh, we, yes, if we yes. take the like uh, production technology anything we cannot solve there will be some only some part will be the tv part by maximum will be yeah, tv right. and only some part will be problem so it is it will be very difficult for teaching no so what what is the solution you'll be giving for that one so what happens is so th- that is where the modern technology is very useful to you because as you yeah. rightly say in a course like production and technology you don't have many yeah, equations or theory yeah yeah correct yeah so what you want to show is and this is done in the west and in a many courses in yeah. many courses that i've seen you collect some short video clippings okay you collect okay. some short video clipping how things are manufactured show them in the class show okay. the relevant videos in the class and show something that is exciting maybe some yeah. you know something that uh, that a mistake occurred or that a certain product has been made in a particular way but it could be made in a different way or show the video and ask the students what they think and then you exp- you teach what has to be taught so what happens is today unfortunately many students are not so good at paying attention number 1 having long minutes of concentration and just listening to only the lecturers they are so used to watching videos listening to audios and so on you want to go their way and teach it without compromising on the principles of teaching so you can grab a 5 minute video that's more than enough you, you don't want it to eat eat up your teaching time yeah, that is like one uh, like, very yeah. effective yeah. Mm. Well, I'm really implementing PPT like uh, yeah. Ah, so uh, see what happens is with the PowerPoint. Yes, it's a bit yeah. uh, effective, but not as effective as showing a real life manufacturing thing. Number one, number two, you want to have a you know a short, maybe two minute quiz that doesn't have any evaluation, but. uh you know ask quick friend questions the other thing that you could do is you can ask students to come up search videos search resources on the web that will pertain to your subject engage them so okay. every course has its own recipe but the objectives are the same thank you mythil sunil yes, from uh, institute of aeronautical engineering sir thank you thank you uh, your course is sure. very effective sir Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions, please? Uh, sir, thank you so much, sir. On behalf of the management staff and students of Global Institute of Engineering Technology, uh, I uh, sure. thank you uh, for sparing your valuable time, accepting our invitation, and delivering such a wonderful lecture. Uh, I am confident that this will definitely help these all teachers uh, in uh, uh, making themselves to the next version. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you once again. Sure, sure. Thank you, thank you very much. Dear participants, we all uh, now will break for lunch, and again we'll uh, assemble back uh, sharp at 2:15 p.m. Please do not uh, sign off. Uh, keep your meeting on, and assemble back at 2:15 p.m. sharp for the next session. Thank you so much. Sure, right. Thank you.
సైన్ అప్ చేయొద్దు అన్నారు వీడియో అలాగే ఉంటుంది